Hello, I'm John Ward on behalf of Physical Gold Fund and Anglo Far East. Today, it's my privilege to talk with Philip Judge, the founding director of Anglo Far East. AFE Custodial Company, a subsidiary of Anglo Far East, is the precious metals agent for Physical Gold Fund. Welcome, Philip. Good to be joining you today, John. Philip, as a precious metals custodian, you've had close to two decades experience dealing in Switzerland. Can you give us some history of this background? Yes, John. Actually, uh, the Anglo Far East uh, origins really go back to 1991 when we started speaking to uh, people about the importance of including some gold and silver in their portfolio for protection against financial uncertainty. And the interesting thing about that, back in 1991, we're, we're about 11 years into a bear market in gold and silver, which would actually continue um, for another several years. So we, soon after that, started distributing some small uh, gold and silver collectible coins or medallions. And as we were doing that through the 90s, we started to see that there was a a demand from from very sophisticated, forward-thinking people looking to uh, have private custody of precious metals. And so we started to do research, which, uh, you know, to provide... I guess the the best, most private and uh, safe security of precious metals, which eventually led us to being in Switzerland towards the end of the 1990s. Now, at that time, we were heading into a 20-year bear market in precious metals. So we were in Switzerland knocking on the doors of refineries and vaulting companies and transportation companies and and insurers and so on. We were able to... Uh, by being an early bird in this market, we were developing relationships. One thing we learn in Switzerland is that business in Switzerland is all about relationships. So we've been very fortunate that we've been enjoying long-term, you know, multi-decade relationships in Switzerland now. And uh, we've managed to learn a lot from this because we've been on the ground in Switzerland now coming up 20 years, John. So, Philip, your company, Anglo Far East, has chosen Switzerland as the jurisdiction for storing your clients' gold and silver. And right now, there's, there's some talk on the internet about Switzerland perhaps no longer being the safe jurisdiction that it used to be for the custody of precious metals. What's your view on this? Well, this is a really great topic, actually, and it's one that I spend a lot of time in. And uh, it's important to say that we've chosen Switzerland as our number one jurisdiction, but we do believe in international diversification. In fact, you know, precious metals is all about diversification, John. So certainly we don't like to say, okay, there's only one jurisdiction in the world. But if we're to evaluate them all, which we'll do in this call, then we usually come up with saying Switzerland's the number one. The reasons we do this, it's actually a particular checklist that we run, and I call these key custody jurisdictional safeguards, John. Well, we're obviously going to need to explore that expression, that phrase. But just let me ask you first, why are we seeing this online chatter about Switzerland no longer being safe? Well, I mean, part of it is the rumor mill. And, you know, some of it's true and some of it's probably uh, grown a little bit quicker than it should have. Because, you know, very often rumors, particularly, I guess, Internet rumors are based on misinformation. Oftentimes there's some facts there, but they may be unverified or unsupported. So what I'm going to try to do today is throw some clarity on this. Now, very clearly in Switzerland, there's been an erosion of bank secrecy, and that's very, very clear. But the perception out there is that this applies across the board. But really, to emphasize it, this much publicized change in bank regulation, that's a fact. That's happened. But the perception, of course, Switzerland's uh, in general caved into US and, and European demands of full transparency and the end of bank secrecy. So, as I said, this is true in the case of, of private banking and bank secrecy for foreigners and so on. But uh, precious metals, John, is very, very different. It's important to understand here the difference or what I call the dividing line between bank stored precious metals and private non-bank storage. You see, gold and silver in a vault of the bank is considered by law in Switzerland a bank financial asset, an asset of the bank. And so therefore, it naturally falls under Swiss banking regulation. And we believe that's less safe for two reasons. Obviously, the first thing is potential counterparty risk. You know, the question is, what happens in the case of a bank failure to that gold and silver that you've got uh, on, on your Swiss bank account, for example? 
Um, and of course, the second one, which is what we're talking about here, is that it falls under Swiss bank regulation, which is of course subject to this eroding privacy that we've been seeing. But now here's the other side of the dividing line, John. It's really important people understand this. Gold and silver outside of banks, in other words, gold and silver stored in privately owned and operated vaults, is not a financial asset or a bank asset, but it's private property. In other words, it's not covered under Swiss banking regulation. There's also a thing of contract law. If I've got gold and silver held with a bank and I'm a client of the bank, then I've signed an investor contract or, or, or a bank depositor contract with that bank. If I've got gold stored in a vault, in a private security vault that is a non-bank vault, then what I have in that case, that precious metals is governed by a storage contract, which is very, very different to a depositor or investor contract held with the bank. This is obviously an important point, Philip. So let me ask you what evidence you can muster to support your view on this. Yeah, great question, John. It's actually confirmed on multiple sources. First of all, let's start with our Swiss law firm. And we've had for many years engaged a very, very good firm in Switzerland and their specialty is finance, regulatory and custody law. That's their area of specialty. And they're very, very clear on this. They're very clear on the way Swiss custody law works. And what I'll do is I'll quote you from the legal opinion I have here. Quote, the Swiss Bank Act and the Swiss Bank Ordinances are applicable to entities that conduct banking business activities as defined in the Swiss Bank Act. However, the Swiss Bank Act does not govern the private storage of gold bars by non-bank entities in Switzerland. Private movable property, including precious metals stored with private security storage companies, are protected under the provisions of the Swiss Private International Law Act and also the Swiss Civil Code, end quote. So you can see there from this legal opinion that there's a very clear distinction between entities that are operating bank activities and precious metals that are stored in private vaults, John. Let me just get this absolutely clear because it's so important. If I understand you right, you're saying that if gold and silver is stored in a bank vault in Switzerland, it is considered a financial asset and therefore falls under Swiss banking law and regulation. But if that same gold and silver were instead held in a private or non-bank vault, it's private property and is not considered a financial asset under Swiss law. Is that correct? You've summarized it perfectly. You know, another thing too, which I, I probably should add is I'm in Switzerland three, four, five times a year and I'm regularly in conversations and meetings with senior management of the top security storage and transport company with the refineries and so on and other people, other market uh, participants in the precious metals industry in Switzerland. And, you know, again, all of these discussions, all of these meetings confirm the same thing. In fact, just literally a few weeks ago, I was with the managing director of Switzerland's largest uh, uh, transport security company and he said the same thing. Switzerland has no legal requirement for inventory or reporting of privately stored non-bank storage. How much gold and silver is stored where for whom is not recorded or reported to any government or regulatory authorities. And it, you know, even for that to start to change, for the laws to change and then putting in the infrastructure to actually do this kind of bar registry reporting that's been talked about on the internet, that's going to take decades to literally do it. Another point to add to this, John, is the fact that gold and silver in private vaults in Switzerland has seen huge growth in recent years. And so that indicates to me that international confidence in Switzerland as a jurisdiction remains strong, particularly amongst large institutions, things like mining companies, and, and of course sovereigns, other nations that are, that are owning and holding some precious metals are choosing Switzerland still to this very day as a jurisdiction. It also indicates to us that net inflows of gold for storage in Switzerland is exceeding the outflows to other jurisdictions. So those, those are two important things. So to summarise, as, you, as you've already pointed out, when storing private property or valuables in private storage in, in vaults in Switzerland, in fact, it's interesting, there's no difference if I'm storing valuables in a private vault, I could be storing precious fine art, precious wines or precious metals. Under Swiss law, it's absolutely no different. It's the storage, the private storage of valuable private property and it's not really important under law what type of precious property that is, John. So Philip, 
Earlier, you mentioned key custody jurisdictional safeguards, quite a mouthful. I'd like you to explain exactly what this phrase refers to. When it comes to storage, John, or custody of precious metals or anything for that matter, there's several key interlocking pieces that, that need to be looked at or safeguards. And this is particularly true, of course, on a country or jurisdictional level to sort of determine the highest levels of safety and security that we're going to get from that particular jurisdiction. So that's what I refer to as key custody jurisdictional safeguards. But before I get into the details of that, maybe probably the best thing is to use an example. The first time somebody enters a high security vault facility for the first time, the first thing they're going to learn is that that facility is somewhat like the layers of an onion. There's the first layer, which is where you enter the facility from the street, the second layer, the third layer, and each layer that you go through, there's ever higher security. It requires further authorization to get in there to eventually, if you can peel back all these security layers, you'll get into the inner sanctum or the very inner vault where the most, the most uh, valuable uh, materials or assets are stored. So the most high security facilities in the world, like the ones we use in Switzerland, there may be 10, 11, 12 or more layers of security from the street to the very inner vault where the, golden, where the gold's held at least, versus some other jurisdictions or some other facilities which may only have two, three or four levels of security from the street to the inner, inner vault. So basically trying to use that as an analogy, it's the way we look at a jurisdiction. So what you're saying, Philip, is that if we take your analogy of a security vault and apply it on a country level, the higher the number of layered safeguards, the higher the level of overall security. You've got it exactly right. When we're reviewing a jurisdiction for the safeguard of precious metals, we like to evaluate or analyse these key custody jurisdictional safeguards in the same way you would a security vault, meaning the greater number of security layers, as I just explained, before you get into the inner sanctum or the inner valuables, then, of course, the greater level of overall security. Okay, so could you take us through these safeguards and maybe explain specifically how they relate to Switzerland? Okay, great, great. One of my favourite subjects. I've got 10 in total. Now, you could probably add a few to these, but these are the key ones, um, and, and here they are. First is history. Second is geography, military, sovereignty, neutrality, legality, secrecy, market proximity, financial stability, and then political stability. So there, there I've said history, geography, military, sovereignty, neutrality, legality, secrecy, market proximity, financial stability, and finally, political stability. So let's jump in. We'll look at the first one, history. History basically is track record or experience. Now, in today's world, Switzerland or London are the oldest commercial centres for precious metals trading and dealing and storage, and Switzerland is the oldest. So, you know, when you look at uh, Switzerland as a financial hub or base, you'll see that it's been doing international banking for foreigners, in other words, protection of foreigners' assets for at least 200 years, but actually it goes back uh, before that. And interesting about that is... International banking 200 years ago it was gold and silver banking because in those days paper money as we have in today's form in the, in the fiat form just didn't exist. That's certainly not at the level it does today. Actually, you can take the history of Switzerland and, and go back all the way to the early 1300s and you'll learn that Switzerland became a hub for the private custody of, of uh, European assets right back at that time at the end of the Holy Crusade. So it's got a long, long track record. If I own a Lamborghini, I'm not going to take my valuable Lamborghini to the corner mechanic, John, who's just, you know, graduated from mechanic school. I'm going to take it to a Lamborghini uh, specialist that's been in the industry. He knows his Lamborghinis for many years. He has the right knowledge of the complexity of that type of car and so on. So that's the kind of analogy I like to use. Track record and experience also equals infrastructure developed. In other words, when you're new to something, you're not going to have all the pieces or it's going to take you some time to get all the pieces together. In the case of Switzerland, because of its long, long history and track record in precious metals operation, uh, storage, transportation, it's got massive, massive in infrastructure uh, which would take anybody else uh, many decades, if not, in fact, probably hundreds of years to develop. So what we've been seeing, I, I think, in, in uh, recent years is several emerging jurisdictions that are merging 
uh, emerging into the precious metals industry, which is great, and we were all for that, but uh, when compared to to Switzerland and London, they just don't have that experience or all that infrastructure. So, Philip, then, tell us about geography and how that functions as a safeguard in the case of Switzerland. The next two safeguards are interrelated, John, Um, and it really comes back to one thing. If you've got something of value, you need to be able to defend it. You need to be able to secure it. So geographically, which is the next key safeguard, is where Switzerland is so, so unique, and it's unique for one thing, which we call the Swiss Alps. Uh, If you look at um, the history of European wars, uh, you'll see that Switzerland has never, never been invaded. It's never been involved in a war. It's just simply never been invaded. In fact, you take a train ride anywhere in Switzerland, um, you very quickly learn that it's geographically impossible to invade with an army. So if you compare that with some, some city states or, or even worse still, island states that are emerging in precious metals, you, can, you start to, such as Singapore or Hong Kong, you just see how vulnerable they are geographically. So Switzerland, first of all, it's got this natural protection of the Swiss Alps. But another layer to this, and we're talking about security layers, not only the natural geographical protection, but Switzerland's got engineered geographical protection. So to get around in Switzerland, to connect the three portions of that country together, you've got the Swiss Alps in the middle. And uh, what Switzerland has done over the last several hundred years is developed this vast infrastructure of bridges, tunnels, roads and railways, and it's incredible infrastructure. But what a lot of people don't realise is that all of this infrastructure has been designed to have to be controlled collapsed or uh, in a controlled way be destroyed in the case of an invasion. In other words, a civil engineer that may have been contracted to build a bridge, design and build a bridge or a tunnel, as a, as a civil engineer, he's also a military officer, and in the capacity of a military officer, he's got the charge of also designing the collapsing of that tunnel should it be required in the, in the, in the case of an invasion or war. So that's the interesting thing about the Swiss here. In fact, it brings us right now to the next safeguard, which is the Swiss military. And the, the old quote about the Swiss here is that the Swiss don't have an army, Switzerland is an army. So uh, it's, it's really interesting because if you look at the history of, of Swiss military, you learn that for hundreds of years they've been routinely described as the best standing army in the world. You know, even Napoleon Bonaparte said that. There's a book by a gentleman called John McPhee, John. Uh, it's called La Place de la Concorde Suisse, which is an in-depth look at the Swiss military, which we've got that book here in the company. We spent a lot of time looking at it. He describes really how the Swiss military is actually operates as a, a militia army and by that every adult male when he graduates from high school is required to spend mandatory service time in the swiss army and then he will be back spending time in the swiss army every year for most of the rest of his life every home in switzerland has got a military grade, grade firearm at least one or two or depending how many males live under the roof of that house you know when they first join the military they're given a a machine gun, and they taught to uh, to keep that gun in in uh, in full service and good condition at all times. And of course, they're trained to use it. So basically, if you were to invade Switzerland, every single home is your army. So it, it makes it a a very very strong uh, country from the standpoint of its sovereignty uh, and its ability to protect what it has. Every time I'm in Switzerland, I'll take a train, John, from Zurich down south uh, to Mendrisio in the Ticino province, and uh, it's a beautiful part of Switzerland. Going through the Goddard Pass, you've got the Swiss Alps snow covered on both sides of the train, and it's not unusual to see Swiss aircraft, or I should say, the Swiss Air Force and their fighter planes, come from nowhere huddled down between the Alps and just flying through at massive speed. And the thing about that is nobody knows where these planes come from. The, the Swiss Air Force, the, the planes, the hangars, the runways are completely concealed. You can't see them from, from the air or the land. And it's just incredible the way Switzerland has developed all of this military infrastructure. Actually, if you look at uh, the history of the Nazi invasion of Europe, you learn that the first thing the Nazis did was confiscate gold, followed by food and, and, and fine art. But the reason for that was the Third Reich had this huge appetite for gold to fund the war. 
And Hitler knew the majority of gold, uh, of Europeans' gold was, was stored in Switzerland, but yet it never, never entered his mind to attempt an invasion in Switzerland because he knew it was simply impossible. You know, he tried to, to invade Russia, but he certainly never tried to invade Switzerland. So in summary, Switzerland's got the best protection from external theft of its gold and silver, both through its geography and also its military, John. Well, okay, Philip, that is fascinating. And it leads us on to the next safeguard, which is legality. What can you tell us about that? You're right, John. Legality is the next section. And, and, you know, we mentioned earlier at the beginning of this call that gold and silver stored in non-bank security vaults comes under Swiss private property laws and is protected under the provisions of the Swiss Private International Law Act and also the Swiss Civil Code. It's interesting, the Swiss Civil Code, it said, protects every personal right there is worth mentioning, but most of all, it's got an emphasis on, on uh, privacy and also private property. So, yeah, again, the Swiss Civil Code very much focuses on the protection of uh, privacy and property. And, of course, you know, th- these two areas, privacy and property, is further protected under the Swiss Constitution. Switzerland is very advanced in its legal framework built around the protection of privacy and property ownership, both for Swiss nationals but also for its international clients, which is the reason for the Swiss Private International Law Act that a lot of people don't even know exists. And actually there's something else that's super unique about Switzerland. Inside the federal government of Switzerland, there's a department that is specifically uh, focused on the precious metals industry, and that's how important this is to Switzerland. It's called the Swiss Central Office for Precious Metals Control, and uh, so again, Swiss Central Office of Precious Metals Control. Again, a lot of people don't even know it exists. It makes it unique in all the world because federal governments in countries, even if they do have precious metals operations, have simply never put together a department specifically dedicated to this industry. In the case of Switzerland, the uh, Office for Precious Metals Control is specifically focused on ensuring industry good practices which is, in other words, the quality of everything within this industry, from refining practices to assaying to, you know, energy consumption, for example. Switzerland is leading the world in in auditing where source gold comes from, such as, you know, uh, human rights in in mines, environmental practices in mines. Switzerland will not accept... uh, uh, gold, for example, that's come from mines that have that have not had a complete and thorough audit as to the human rights and the environmental practices within that mine. That's world leading. And the other thing about this precious metals control office in the Swiss government is that it's focused on the legal protection under Swiss law uh, of this industry. So this is one of the other key safeguards in the legality. Uh, safeguard that we're, we're discussing here. It really makes Switzerland, you know, head and shoulders above any other country. So, Philip, you said secrecy is protected in the Swiss Civil Code. And, of course, secrecy is also one of the key jurisdictional safeguards that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, it's a very, very important part. Uh, and, you know, secrecy is all about the way the Swiss have always done their business. Um, probably, the, you know, sometimes we would better be served using the word discretion. They're very discreet by their very nature and it's reflected in everything they do. In fact, there's a joke often told that if you ask an Italian one question, they'll they'll tell you about their entire life. But if you ask a Swiss the same question, he'll only tell you the minimum that's required to answer the question. So it's just a very different way that they conduct business. And uh, how that relates to private storage in gold and, of gold and silver is very simple. Switzerland's in the top two or three countries in the world for the amount of precious metals that are in storage in the jurisdiction. And the location of many of these vaults, if not most, is simply not known to the outside world. So the point there is it's hard to steal something when you don't know where it is. So that's a really important part of the secrecy and the discretion that is very much part of the Swiss culture, particularly in this industry here. It's always been a Swiss hallmark when it comes to the custody of other people's assets. We know that uh, in line with the rest of the world, the Swiss banking law uh, has had a, had a shift in terms of its former bank secrecy, but that's in, that's in line with the rest of the world. But, uh, you know, I can confirm from on-the-ground experience that is not the case with the private storage and the private custody of gold and silver, John. Well, the next two key safeguards you've listed are presumably linked, and that would be sovereignty and neutrality. Exactly. Now, 
sovereignty, if you go to the dictionary, you'll see that's the independent authority over geographical area. In this case, we're talking about the independent authority of the government to govern the country of Switzerland. It's the, not only, I guess, the government, it's the ability to govern and manage with outside interference some outside authority jumping in and overturning your rule or government. So clearly we've got that in Switzerland. It's able to enforce its sovereignty both politically and militarily, as we've said. And, you know, it would be our opinion that a non-sovereign state or a quasi-sovereign state would not be a good jurisdiction to store precious metals for that reason. The ability for some outside force to just come in, kick over the military, break open the vault doors and, 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 and empty out the gold and silver. Switzerland has the ability uh, to make the decisions in the best interest of Switzerland itself and not the outside groups. So that's, that's really important as well. Uh, and of course, we all know about the next safeguard, which is neutrality. Uh, Switzerland has never been a war. It's uh, the only country in the world that's remained neutral for hundreds of years. In fact, it's obviously had border skirmishes in the past, the distant past. But it's one of those jurisdictions, countries that in Europe, you're just not going to go near it. You know, everyone's actually scared of it. You know, they've remained neutral, in, including the world wars. And even in the last 50 years, you've seen this neutrality uh, in its psyche, in Switzerland's psyche, with its entrance into the United Nations and European Union and so on. It's very, very private and it's a very neutral country. It doesn't want to take sides, but it will take your, your assets and manage them for you sort of thing. You've identified what you call market proximity as another important safeguard. Could you explain this phrase? I'll put it further down the list, John, but I, I don't mean to diminish its importance in these key custody jurisdictional safeguards. It's one of the key ones. Um, and it's one of the key ones that makes Switzerland and also London quite unique in its positioning for the safe custody of precious metals. What people do not realise about Switzerland is that Switzerland transports and refines up to 70% of the annual precious metals on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. So that's mine production, scrap metal that's coming back into the market and so on. Switzerland is refining up to 70% of that of an, on an annual basis. It's really the, the global hub of precious metals logistics. You'd have to ask why. Well, obviously, for all these key jurisdictional safeguards that we're talking about, they already exist. So this is how come the industry has developed over the last two or more hundred years because of everything we're talking about right now. Four of the largest refineries in the world uh, are in Switzerland. The infrastructure is the best in the world, as we've been talking about. Uh, and it's taken many hundreds of years for it to build this infrastructure, which is why it enjoys such a huge slab of the of the annual precious metals refining, transportation, and so on. It's well understood within Switzerland itself, the regulators, we talked already about the central office for precious metals earlier. It's well understood that the precious metals processing refining, refining industry is a huge employer of Swiss workers. It's employing thousands of workers around the country. So it's a protected industry. They, they don't want to mess with it because they realize it's so, so important to the Swiss economy. In other words, it's often, be, it's often said that precious metals in Switzerland is not a cottage industry, it's a major industry. You know, we've got emerging jurisdictions coming up. Uh, you know, you could look at Singapore or Dubai, but, but they just don't enjoy this huge majority of the market, you know, which is an important uh, key safeguard. Another thing that you, you think of here is, is um, diversification. You can choose multiple private vaults in Switzerland. Uh, so you don't have everything in one jurisdiction. Very, very liquid. In other words, if you bring your precious metals back into the market, you've got four refineries that are exporting to all the key countries that are buying in the world, so you've got great liquidity. If I've got gold stored in the, in the middle of the outback of Australia in a super secure vault, it's not going to help me if I want to suddenly get it into the market uh, for redemption or liquidity purposes because I'm going to have to fly in a plane and fly it out into another jurisdiction or whatever. So that's, these are all the little pieces of market proximity that make Switzerland such a safe place. Well, the final two key safeguards are political and financial stability. What role do they play? Yeah, pretty much speak for themselves, I guess, John. It's difficult to protect or keep assets safe if the country's in a political or financial turmoil. Stability is the key to safety, as we all know. And so ask the question, when was the last time you saw a civil uprising in Switzerland or riots on the streets? The answer is never, because it just doesn't happen there. And, and again, as I said, every male 
Swiss man, Swiss national is, a, is also a, a member of the military. So you're not going to get the kind of uprisings that may have happened in other countries. So it's, it's financial stability speaks for itself, of course. It's been the bank in the world for hundreds of years and continues to do that. I've always said, John, we've got to not be fooled by what the Swiss let the rest of the world think about them. They know what they're doing. Make no mistake about that. They understand the world they are in. They understand the importance of this industry. And so, you know, they're not concerned about other people's perception. As I said earlier, we've seen a net growth a uh, huge growth, in fact, uh, of, of precious metals in storage in Switzerland just in the last several years. And it's really showing a trend that more and more sophisticated thinkers are, are continuing to agree that Switzerland still remains the best uh, place in the world. Um, not to say that I would ever choose to put precious metals into a bank uh, storage box in Switzerland. I would never do that. But in a privately operated security vault, absolutely. So, Philip, a couple of times in this conversation, you've mentioned emerging jurisdictions. And, in fact, there's been, we talked about online chatter about jurisdictions, and there's been some positive talk about these emerging jurisdictions in the Far East, for example, comparing them favorably with Switzerland. What, what's your comment on that? I think most of the emerging uh, jurisdictions fall down on multiple levels. Uh, geographical uh, you know, protection, military protection doesn't exist many times. You look at Singapore, for example, you just, the market proximity is a problem. Uh, you know, if I store precious metals in a place like Singapore, it's not going to be very easy to, to liquidate large amounts very quickly without transporting it. There's all these logistical issues where they fall down. And, uh, of course, track record and experience, as we talked about earlier, is it's just a huge one. Um, so, you know, I'm not here to bash anybody or any of these jurisdictions. And I, I think the more market players we have uh, in this world, the better off for the industry. But uh, I, I still keep coming back to these 10 um, key safeguards, and, and most of these will fall down on ma many of these, several. Earlier, I used the, the analogy of if you go to a, a, a vault facility, which only has three or four layers. You might come in through the front gate and then you'll enter the secu first security door, then you pass through security checks, go through a second security door and one more into the vault. So you've got four levels of security versus others where it may, may you know, literally take you 12 or more layers. You're going to have to go underground or, or, and, and a bunch of other security features. So the more of these safeguards you've got in place, the, the better the, the, the jurisdiction in our view. Well, let me ask you as we wrap this up, do you have any final comments for us on this question of safe custody for precious metals and specifically on the choice of jurisdiction? Well, again, um, well, let's quickly just run through them in summary for Switzerland. It's got the history, hundreds of years of experience. It's got the geography. We talked about the natural uh, protection of the Alps followed by the engineered protection, which is you know, fantastic in the way uh, that Switzerland thinks. We've already talked about its military uh, a lot and, and you know Switzerland doesn't have an army it is an army it's neutrality it's sovereignty uh, it's ability to make decisions and enforce them it's got the military and the political strength to do that the legality that's the huge part I mean the, the legal framework for the precious metals industry has been developed over decades in fact hundreds of years as we've talked about it's got its own government department for the protection of this Secrecy is part of their culture, and I think, you know, I'm just going to hit on the same point again. Sorry to be redundant, but, uh, you know, bank secrecy has been eroded in Switzerland in line with what's happened in the rest of the world, but it has not affected and will not affect the precious metals industry. If it, if it does, it's going to be many, many decades, but we're watching that all the time, which is why we've got our uh, industry relationships, our legal firm that we work closely with, speak with all the time. Market proximity, as I said, it's the leading refiner and processor in the entire world, which means it's transporting and storing uh, and processing more precious metals than any other country in the world. Uh, and finally, it's financial and political stability, John. So th those are those key safeguards. Uh, I don't think you'll find another jurisdiction that hold up so well to those questions. I think my final point is that I'm really glad that we're entering this period of questioning, John, because the market now, particularly for the sophisticated and the institutional investor, are starting to ask the right questions and have been for the last couple of years. And uh, that's why I think it's great that these debates 
uh, or discussions are out there and uh, we uh, continue to watch this market from the private custody of precious metals very, very closely and uh, we'll keep updates coming out as, as things develop and change. Well, thank you, Philip Judge. Thanks, John. And thank you to our listeners. We look forward to connecting with you again soon.